You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the narrow mind. All right, and welcome to another edition of The Narrow Mind. This is The Narrow Mind. For all you non-addicts out there that might be tuning in for the first time, my name is Gene Cook, and I am the host of The Narrow Mind program that airs Monday through Friday at various times. And you might be asking, Gene, how can we keep up with the different times? (laughs) I try to keep the schedule as consistent as possible. And so this week, most of our shows are going to be at 6 p.m. in the evening on the West Coast, which means 9 p.m. on the East Coast. But if you're wondering how we can uh, uh, stay on track together with the schedule times, it's very simple. If you look at the homepage, you'll see there be- beneath the Narrow Mind download graphic, the one with the uh, the woman looking through the keyhole, just beneath that, if you... Click on the link there. It says, would you like to receive the weekly schedule via email? Just click here and send us an email. What you do is you click there. That'll add you to the Yahoo groups, and I will send out announcements concerning the topics, what's going to be played on the Narrow Mind, the the, the program times, and I'll also be sending out extras through this email group, extras such as special events. You know, we've got Earth Day coming up. We uh, we might go out to one of the beach communities here in Southern California and do an outreach, or I will begin to talk about plans for our upcoming Africa trip that's going to take place in late July, early August. So you will get extra information that uh, regular listeners won't get if you subscribe to the email list. And so I encourage you to do that. Real simple, just click on that thing, send an email, and then it's going to ask you to confirm your email address. As soon as you do that, you will be officially added. All right, you may also notice that the poll is up on the right-hand corner of the homepage still. Uh, the, the survey, the Narrow Mind live broadcast, change time, question mark. And so if I look at this uh, poll right now so far, We've got over 275 results, and it looks like 81, which is uh, almost 30% of our listeners, uh, said that they would like it to be at 6 p.m. So we're going to keep it at 6 p.m. on the West Coast as often as possible. It's going to be challenging for us from time to time because we seem to have more things going on in the evening as a family and as a church than we do in the morning. So we will keep it at 6 p.m. Our broadcast tomorrow night, however... That's Friday night, the 9th of March, will be at 5 p.m. Now, the reason why I have to bump it back one hour is because I have a speaking engagement at University of California, San Diego, UCSD in La Jolla, California, Premier Medical School in Southern California. And so I'm looking forward to addressing a college group there called Harvest, an Asian college group, Uh, some really bright young men and women. I'm looking forward to being with them again. I think this is going to be my third or fourth. They have asked me to come and address the subject of Christianity and postmodernism. It should be an interesting uh, time tomorrow night. Now, tonight we're not going to be taking any calls because I've got plenty of audio that I'd like to try to cover in the one-hour time frame that we have before us tonight. What audio am I going to cover? Well, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the dialogue that took place last week between what has come to be known as the Rational Response Squad. You've probably heard me talk about them from time to time. If you are a fan of this show, their website, rationalresponders.com, a bunch of uh, young atheists that have put together a website. They actually have a a squad, or sometimes we might refer to it as a a team or or a club. And so they've got uh, a group of young men and women that uh, like to argue against Christianity. Well, they like to argue against all forms of God, to be fair. Uh, Well, Do they like to argue against all forms of God? No, actually, Brian Sabian, the leader of the group, says that uh, he he, he is certain that the Christian God doesn't exist, uh, but he is open to the possibility that other gods might exist, whatever that means. Well, they had Ergen Kainer on. Now, Ergen Kainer is the president of Liberty University. And for those of you that may not be familiar with Liberty University, the only thing that I can really say that I know about Liberty University is that Jerry Falwell has a huge influence there. I think he used to be the president, if I'm not mistaken. And it is not a Calvinistic university. Okay, it is a a Bible college. 
And uh, the reason why I know it's not a Calvinistic university is because the President Ergen Kainer was going to engage in a debate with Dr. James White uh, several months ago. And for whatever reasons, I don't know the particular details, and it really doesn't matter to me, but for whatever reason, the debate didn't happen. Now, because the debate didn't happen and because I heard various rumors of why the debate didn't happen, I was, uh, I, I kind of, I guess, I already had some um, predisposed uh, thoughts or or uh, expectations concerning Ergen Kainer as far as his uh, him being an Arminian and and him not willing to uh, go forward with debate with Dr. White for whatever reasons. I am very convinced that not only is Reformed theology the most accurate and correct understanding of the Word of God in our day, and in days past, I should add that. But I'm also under the impression that because Arminian theology doesn't accurate, accurately reflect the, the teachings of Scripture, it does for the most part, but uh, especially in the area of soteriology, that it is deficient. And therefore, if we go to a discussion with the atheist, if we go to the marketplace of uh, worldviews here, and we are already leaning on a... Uh, a worldview that is deficient. Not that Christianity is deficient, not that the Bible is deficient, but that uh, Arminianism is a deficient understanding of the Bible, then we are already at a disadvantage. I guess you could say I kind of had some prejudiced ideas about Ergen Kainer before I heard the debate. Now, having listened to the whole three-hour debate, um, my understanding of Ergen Kainer has changed a little bit. And this is how it's changed. I, I still think that his his uh, view of Ar- the Arminian doctrines of uh, of soteriology are deficient. I still think that he's handicapped when it comes to arguing against atheists with a deficient Arminian worldview. But on the personal level, I was impressed. I was impressed by Ergen Kainer's disposition. I was impressed by Ergen Kainer's patience. I was impressed on several levels with Ergen Kainer. And although I don't agree 100% with the answers that he gave, which you're going to see here in just a moment because we're going to go through some of them, I do think that he did a good job overall of representing Christianity. All right? So I will say that at the outset. Now, that's not to say that I still don't think that his... Arminian view is wrong. That's not to say that I don't think that his evidential uh, classical approach to defending the faith is wrong. That's not to say that I don't think that he was handicapped going into the debate like having one arm tied behind his back. But I'm talking about on a personal level, his disposition toward the atheist, the way that he conducted himself, it was very respectful. He was very gracious. And uh, I think the guy would make a great Calvinist. He's got a great mind. He's a smart guy. And so now that I've uh, laid all these compliments on him, let's go ahead and listen to what we've got here so I can show you uh, what I think were some of the highlights of the debate. And we're just going to go through these one at a time. I'll play the clip for you, and then I'll stop it and uh, make my particular comment about the clip that you just heard. Now, remember the Rational Response Squad. First of all, um, they start out this conversation with the understanding that the primary format is going to be Brian Sapient asking questions of Ergen Kainer. So Brian Sapient gets the luxury of sitting back and asking questions for over two hours. Now, bless Ergen Kainer's soul for willing to do, for be, now, now bless Ergen Kainer's soul for being willing to do that. I personally would never do that. Why? Because how are you going to win a football game if you only play defense? You can't. It's impossible. You you, you make yourself ultra vulnerable, first of all, because you may not have all the answers to the questions. And secondly, you're not really having the opportunity for fair exchange where you are uh, engaging and and showing not only that you do have answers on uh, some particular level, but 
showing the weakness of your opponent, that he doesn't have answers to these questions. So like I said, God bless Ergen Kaner for his willingness to sit there and be cross-examined for over two hours, but I certainly wouldn't allow it to be happen. I certainly wouldn't allow it to, to happen to me. All right, so let's go ahead and play the first clip. You think it's an errant? Yes, I, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is true because I believe in the God who wrote it. Okay. So uh, even though I believe there's manuscript evidence, I think there's there's. Uh, uh, I, I believe inherently in the God who wrote it. If there's a God, and if Jesus is that God, and Jesus said the Bible is the word of God, then if all those ifs hold up which obviously I don't assume you believe, but if they hold up, then I have no problem believing that, that the Bible could be the Word of God, yeah. You say Bible could be the Word of God. Does that mean that you think there's sure. a possibility that you could be wrong? Yeah. No, I, well, I, I take the possibility that everything can be wrong. I, I don't think, see, that's my, that's my whole issue. I think doubt is healthy. Okay, right there. You can see right out of the gate. Now, this is eight minutes into the recording that I have. I, I'm going off of the unedited the unedited version that was put out by the Rational Response Squad. And so at approximately eight minutes into my version that I have here, you hear something come out of the, the mouth of Ergen Kaner that for me as a Christian and as a presuppositional uh, Reformed Christian, I hear something very troubling. <laughs> and that is that the Word of God is being called into doubt. Okay, obviously we should expect the unbeliever to call the Word of God into doubt. But here, because I think Ergen Kainer is attempting to be consistent with his Armenian understanding of epistemology and his Armenian understanding of the Word and the nature of things, um, his evidential approach to apologetics, he is giving um, away the 100% assurance that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, why would he do that? Why would a Christian, not just a Christian, but um, a, a professor, a, a president of a, of a Christian university, why would a professor of a Christian university be willing to say to an atheist that I could be wrong about the Word of God being the Word of God? That's what, that's what he's saying here. Why would he say that? And that's because, once again, like Greg Kokel, he wants to have everything that he believes um, confirmed by evidence. Now, if you didn't hear my critique of Greg Kokel on Tuesday, I think it would be worth going back and listening to. Because this is the same thing that we're hearing again. If everything that we believe as Christians, in other words, he, he's approaching the unbeliever in such a way that he's saying, look, I'm willing to play by the same rules you are. You, you say that you want evidence. Well, I want evidence too. And so this is exactly what the Bible warns us against. He is not set a, setting apart in his heart. He's not sanctifying Christ as Lord before he gives an answer to the unbeliever or the person who asks about the reason that is within him. What he's doing is he is allowing the unbeliever to set the stage by assuming that we can confirm all things by evidence. And so since Ergen Kainer is um, resolved in his mind, uh, he's come to the conviction in his mind that the Word of God can be proved with such things such as manuscript evidence He's willing to throw that out there and say, well, I'm just like you. And th this is what I I'm reading between the lines here, but I believe this is what Ergen Kainer is saying. He's saying, look, Brian, I'm just like you. I want evidence for everything I believe. Well, the problem is that there are certain things in philosophy, whether you are a Christian philosopher or a worldly secular philosopher, there are certain things that are called foundational beliefs that are not confirmed to us by evidence. All right. For example, and I've gone over this, this is probably the third time this week of, as we've been dealing with Greg Kokel, as we've been dealing with part three on presuppositional apologetics. If we say that everything must be confirmed by evidence, including the Word of God, then we're making two fatal errors. Number one, we are appealing to a higher authority to 
prove the Word of God than God's own testimony, which is ludicrous. Secondly, if we can, if we agree with the atheist that everything that we believe must be proven by evidence, then what was the evidence that led us to believe that all things must be proven by evidence? And if you can supply evidence for that belief, what is the evidence that led you to the belief of the belief that all things must require evidence in order to be proven? You see, at the very heart of human understanding is what we call foundational beliefs. These are our presuppositions. For the Christian, his presupposition is that the Bible is the Word of God. It's that simple. For the unbeliever, the unbeliever says that the Bible is not the Word of God, and uh, that's a secondary presupposition, but his main presupposition is that his intellect is the ultimate authority. And so he wants everything uh, to be proven by way of evidence, but he can't offer any evidence for that particular belief that all things must be proven by evidence. I hope I am making myself clear. So this is very troubling for me, that when Ergen Kainer is asked by Brian Sapient, uh, so are you willing to admit that the Bible might be wrong? Ergen's response is that we all start with doubt. And he says, if you don't start with doubt and you start with certainty, then you end up with doubt. Well, Ergen, as much as a nice, as much as I think that you're a nice guy, I couldn't disagree with you more. If you start with doubt, you will end in more doubt. Look what happened to Eve. The word of God is sure. It is trustworthy. It should not be challenged by man. We must conform ourselves to it. Now let's uh, skip ahead here to the next clip. The common ground of saying the Bible is the word of God. That's circular reasoning. Why is the Bible the word of God? Because it says so. Well, that's circular. Right. That, that doesn't make sense. Good, good. So all I was saying is we begin with um, we begin with the common book, like the Bible, and then say, all right, I believe the God of this book. Uh, I believe the Bible proclaims Jesus to be God. So if the Bible proclaims Jesus to be God, and it says Jesus said these things, did these things, either Jesus didn't do those things, or somebody wanted it to happen, or Jesus didn't exist, which all of these ifs, you know, go through the filter of speculation, then at least we start with a common book. Okay. Okay, he's trying to establish common ground. Once again, he's trying to establish common ground with Brian. And the common ground is... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I still got this cough. The common ground is... Look, Brian, I'm just like you. We require evidence for everything we believe. Now, what Ergen Kainer does is he argues initially against presuppositionalism, and he says that presupposition is circular. Okay? He doesn't use the term presuppositionalist, but, or presuppositionalism, but that is in fact what he's talking about. Let me play that first part for you again. He's insisting that to argue presuppositionally would be to argue in a circular manner. I'm going to back it up just a little bit further so you can get the context. Okay, so the Bible is inerrant, but you presented the question to us or the rule to us that we have to, because I, 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 I'm trying to understand that rule of, of the debate, really, or the questioning session. You know, why do we have to admit the Bible's an old book, which really means that it's possible that there could be errors in it when your position is that you think it's inerrant? But you see, it's not my position to try to force that on you. Okay, but all I'm asking for is common ground. And what I was trying to say is, I don't begin with the common ground of saying the Bible's the Word of God. That's circular reasoning. Why is the Bible the Word of God? Because it says so. Well, that's circular. Right. That no, we don't. <laughs> See, this is a common mistake. As presuppositionalists, we don't say the Bible is the Word of God because the Bible says so. We say the Bible is the Word of God because it is the Word of God. There's a difference there. There's a difference between saying, we believe this book because the book says we should believe it. What we're saying is that God ha has made a revelation. God has revealed himself. And there is no greater testimony than his word. Everybody reasons in a circle. The question is, which circle is the circle that can account for reality? The circle that can account for morals, logic, a fallen world, redemption, uh, the one and the many, the various problems that are set forth by philosophers. The only circle that accomplishes this is Christian presuppositionalism. Christian presuppositionalism says 
God exists. God has revealed himself in his word. The highest testimony that we have to prove that God exists is his own testimony. We can't appeal to manuscript evidence. That's not the word of God. Manuscripts are simply copies of the word of God. We can't say, oh, look at all the copies. You see, we have the copies, therefore the real thing must be the real thing. You have to start with the real thing. This is why Ergen doesn't realize it, but his approach is also going to be circular. A little bit later on, when he is asked the question, well, why do you believe the Word of God is the Word of God? He appeals to things like manuscript evidence. So listen to what he's saying. He says, okay, we've got the autograph, the very Word of God that was penned by men under the inspiration of God. And then we've got copies of that. See, so we can prove that the original must be the original because the copies. That's circular. That is totally circular. And Brian, on the other hand, is also reasoning in a circular manner. I don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and so don't confuse me with the Bible, because since I don't believe he's Lord, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. You see, so Brian's presupposition is that Jesus Christ is not Lord, so when he's presented with the evidence, he refuses the evidence, and he continues to reason in a circle by saying, no, wait a minute, that that right that book right there, that claims to be the Word of God, and since I don't believe in the Christian God, I can't believe that book. You see, so then he goes back to point A. If we were to sit down and talk to every single human being, no matter what their religious beliefs, no matter what their philosophy, it would be very easy to uh, demonstrate that at the most basic level that all men begin with a pre- with an unproven presupposition. We say these things are self-evident. And that is our point from where we begin. Or you might call that our axiom. That's where we start. And we reason back to our starting point to establish our starting point. Once again, the rational response squad says, well, we think you should be rational. Well, how do you account for rationality, Mr. Rational Responder? It's self-evident. You see? It's nothing more than a circle. But it can't, it, it's a circle that can't account. It's not a big enough circle. It can account for reality. It can't explain to you where or why we should re- reason rationally or where rationality comes from because it leaves God out of the equation. So, once again, Ergen is uh, unfamiliar with what it means to reason in a circle. In fact, I would say that he's going to do so a little bit later in the uh, conversation. Okay, let's, let's play the next clip. You know, because he doesn't wear robes in choir or uh, he doesn't take my interpretation of, you know, whatever ethical issues. I think that's, not only do I think that's fair, but if, if there are Christians who are listening, uh, I think we're every, every single one of us is guilty. Uh, hey, this is Rick Hawkins. Um, I just have a question yeah. for you real fast. Um, now, you, you had said that you believe that the, the nature of the Bible is, is true and perfect. And I was just curious... Um, what sort of um, you know morality we can derive from uh, Luke fourteen twenty six, where uh, you know Jesus is talking about hating everybody before him, and only after you hate everybody, including yourself, can you can you be? I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you, bro. I heard I heard like twenty six. I heard a verse, but I didn't hear a chapter or book. Uh, I'm sorry. It's I'm like, I'm sorry if I'm coming in too low. It's uh, uh, Luke fourteen twenty six. Okay, and I'll turn there. Is it that our volume is too low? Or distorted? Uh, no, it seems to skip, you guys. It seems to skip. Okay. Hmm. All right. Uh, my, my general question was, what sort of morality can be derived from a book, which, which again, I, I'm assuming that, again, you, you say that you claim this book to be the the, uh, the nature of it to be perfect. So uh, I want to know what your yeah. interpretation of Luke 14.26 is, where the word he uses is missio in Greek, which, as you know, means hate, and it can only be yep. you know, translated as hate. So I was curious what your... Uh, Interpretation of that is morale, like in terms of moral sense. Oh, there's an, there's another great citation. If, if you want to use something on a Christian and you want to see this use of the exact same word, same Greek term, it's in uh, Romans chapter nine, where God, it's God speaking. It's a citation of God speaking from the Old Testament. Where it says, "Esau have I hated." Well, right. wait a minute. So it's not just me supposing to hate my father and mother, but apparently God hates Esau. And that goes against, you know, what I said earlier about God being omnibenevolent or all-loving. Um, you've got one or two options here. 
and, and you can pick. Either A, God really does call us to hate other people, but then you got a real contradiction in Scripture. Because then the whole book of First John says that we're based on our love for our enemy and our love for each other. So then you say there's a contradiction, which means it wouldn't be inerrant. So that's, that's the first option. Second option, though, is that he's talking in a term of nation, national sense, but that doesn't fit this text. You know, like, oh, he hated that country because they stood against Israel. Right. But that doesn't, that doesn't fit this context. This context says you must hate your father and mother and follow me. Uh, another time Jesus said, you know, leave the dead to bury the dead, which seems sort of callous. You know, follow me and leave the corpse on the ground. So either it means you're supposed to hate them or, which I take, the comparative view that he's saying in comparison to. The term is absolutely right. You're absolutely right on the Greek. It is hatred. So could it be that by comparison, I hate one in comparison to the love that I have for another? Now, here's my limitation. Okay, I'm Turkish, and um, I come from, a, from an Islamic background. I was raised as a Muslim and became a Christian. Okay. Well, from my background, you know, until I was 18, I was, uh, until I was almost 18, I was, a, I was a Muslim, there are many words in Turkish for the word love. And even in the Greek, there's five terms for the word love. Right. English is limited. English only has one word. I agree with that. So if I tell you that I love, um, I love my shirt and I love my wife, you know, same word, but by comparison, it's not even the same thing. I think it's there's a term there, in, in a relative term that I think has to come to play here. If somebody takes this literally, they end up saying, well, you know, you have to if to follow Christ, you have to leave your parents. But wait a minute, the Bible says honor your parents, so that could, you know, if if you take it at the literal sense in that you don't take it in its grammatical context or you don't take at least the ability to look at it as a simile uh, or a metaphor or look at it as a comparative phrase, then um, then you're stuck. Okay, um, so I, I'm sorry. I, I don't really understand how that answers my question. I, I was really kind of curious exactly what the uh, um, the morality there would be derived from that quote. I, I understand what you're saying where, you know, you either take it interpretive, interpretively or you take it literally, but even, even, yeah, uh, I, I, interpretively, I it, um, even interpretively. I take it as a comparative, a comparative morality here, yes. Okay. So my so, love for God is greater than even for my love for the family, yes. Right, so, if, so if do you hate, fact, do you hate your family then? No, that's exactly what I said you don't do. You yeah. say, in comparison to, the love that I have for God in comparison to the love that I have for my family, it would make the love for my family seem like hatred. Any more than loving my shirt, I don't hate my shirt, but comparing the love of my shirt to uh, love of my wife, it's not even close. Well, I, I understand that. Or the love that. of my dog or my car. Y yes, sir, I understand that. Uh, my question, though, um, is, you know, the, the text says missio. It doesn't say, it doesn't use any of the words for love, even though you're right. that, that there, In Greek, there is five words for love, and none of them are even close to resembling missio. So I was curious um, if if the verse says to hate, um, why are you interpreting it to mean love? Okay, the reason why I lift this clip is not to critique uh, Ergen Kanner. I think that he's on the right track. In fact, I agree with most of what he says. I would have used the term hyperbole. The reason why I lifted this particular clip is to show that Rook Hawkins is a complete moron, okay? And I don't use that term lightly. I wouldn't use that uh, that description of somebody that just called into my program that had a question about uh, believing in the Bible or somebody that challenged my views on the belief my belief in the Bible. I call him a moron because he's leading a whole bunch of young people astray, a whole bunch of people that are not thinking clearly. He's leading them astray. Rook, I mean, come on. Are, what is so hard to understand the use of a hyperbole? If you don't know what hyperbole is, Rook, let me break it down for you. Hyperbole is a form of extreme language that makes a particular point. Whoever doesn't hate his father, his mother, his brother and sister and follow me is not worthy of me. I mean, do you think as Christians that we are that stupid that we don't understand that there's, uh, well, we got a problem here. Uh, we didn't know, Rook. Gee, Rook, thanks for pointing it out. Jesus says, love all your neighbors, and now he's telling us we have to hate our parents. Gee, what are we going to do, Rook? I mean, come on, dude. I wouldn't even entertain this question. It's so stupid. But notice now it's not even just Brian asking questions. Now Rook has chimed in. 
We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we will continue. You're listening to The Narrow Mind. We're not taking any calls tonight. We're talking about apologetics and the defense of the faith. We're listening to some clips that took place on a radio program last week called The Rational Response Squad, an interview with Ergen Kainer, president of Liberty University. All right, and welcome back on this Thursday afternoon, evening, uh, late night, wherever you are. If you're in Hawaii, I guess it's sometime in the afternoon. And I suppose if you're listening via podcast, it could be 3 o'clock in the morning. All right, let's get back to our critique of the Ergen Kainer Rational Response interview that took place last week at rationalresponders.com. Once again, I'm taking this from the uncut version. Okay, now this is going to be very telling because uh, he's asking, okay, give me your top three reasons why I should believe in God. Now listen to what his top three answers are. Kind of specific reason? No. What, what you would, Well, I guess what you would think would be the best reasons um, okay. to believe well, in I'm God. A, I'm a con- my method is contextual apologetics. I'll try to use whatever context. Um, you mean just use random context. All right, first one. Uh, man's yearning, man's universal yearning. There has never been a people discovered who didn't worship something. I mean, it was even guys like who didn't believe in God at all, Kafka, they still held to a view of transcendence. you got to uh, believe in something greater than yourself, different than yourself, legacy than yourself. I think that points to something. Even if it's not, you want to, you don't want to call it a God. At least that shows an impulse that, that, uh, um, crosses most lines. And I use that then. That's the first apologetic that I use. Sort of the, um, universal year. Okay. I got to stop right there. Notice the first apologetic that is used. The first apologetic that's used by Ergen Kainer is man's universal yearning points to something greater than himself. What? What what if my universal yearning points to sex or drugs? This has nothing to do with the defense of the Christian faith. Even if somebody did argue that the universal yearning was a, a yearning to worship a God, what does this have to do with the Christian God? Once again, I'm, try- I'm trying to show you the distinction between the presuppositional method and the classical method. The classical method, as far as I can see, the evidential method fails on every single level. This is nothing more than natural theology. And, and, and it, what does it teach us? What does it do for the unbeliever? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It can't do anything because it's not biblical. Now, somebody might be saying, well, what about Acts chapter 17? Well, I'm going to get to that in my teaching on presuppositional apologetics at some point. We're in part three now. We have point four and five coming, and probably by the time we get to point five, I'm going to show you how that's not what Paul is doing in Acts chapter 17. Paul is arguing presuppositionally, and I'll demonstrate that when we get to that. But this is ridiculous. If 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 I'm asked, what, <laughs> Mr. Christian, what is the three top reasons that I should be saved The number one answer is, well, you've got this burning in your bosom. I mean, that's what the Mormons say, isn't it? Now, Ergen Kainer didn't say that, but what's the difference? This is Arminian, seeker-sensitive apologetics. And i got to tell you, to use a modern vernacular, it sucks, okay? It, It just plain sucks. Now, let's see what he gives for a second reason. Personal yearning issue. If I'm dealing with somebody who's um, going through the issue of, well, you know, all religions are the same, uh, first thing I always say back to them is I go, well, that's great, but I'm not religious because um, I have a pretty low view of religion. I have a pretty low view of, of legalism, for that matter. And I think we often confuse religion and uh, God. I think God has very little to do with religion. I think Jesus... Well... Once again, this is a, a modern evangelicalism, or should I say a modern evangelifishism that's been spread out over, uh, that's been canvassed in Christian thinking that's simply not biblical. Oh, I'm not religious, I just have a relationship with God. Then why does the Bible use the term religion in a positive manner? He's, James says, you want to know true religion, it's taking care of the widows and the orphans. So why are we as Christians constantly trying to cater to the unbeliever who doesn't want to be religious and say, look, I'm not religious? It's ridiculous. It's it's being ashamed of the gospel. 
what he, he talks about people being uh, confused about the relationship between religion and God. Ergen Kainer is refused about confused about the relationship between religion and God, and Ergen Kainer is re, uh, confused about the relationship between religion and legalism. I'm glad he hates legalism. I hate it too, but it has nothing to do with pure, undefiled religion that James talks about. These are biblical terms. Why are we going to run from them? And Jesus reserved his worst uh, indictment for the religious people of his day, who, um, quite frankly, just did horrible things in his name. I think that people kill in the name of God, and so I don't. I don't like the. I don't. I tell them, you know, I don't like the comparison between religion and God because. I don't. I think it's unfair to blame God for what. Uh, it's a pretty messed up world. I also point to the universality of, of just the beauty of, of the world and the beauty of nature and the, and the, uh, the fact of aesthetic points to a, a, an order that goes into extreme complexity. Um, not just okay. Notice his second argument. His second argument is the teleological argument or the argument of design. He talks about the complexities of natural revelation, man-centered, unchristian defense of the faith. What does the Apostle Paul say about natural revelation in Romans chapter 1? Does anybody get saved by looking at the birds and the bees? Does anybody get saved by watching the sun rise and the moon rise? No. So if I'm asked to give my top three reasons why you should be a Christian, why doesn't he... Notice he hasn't gone to the Bible yet. He talked about man's yearning for something greater, nothing more than natural uh, theology. He talked about uh, man's uh, ability to see God in nature, nothing more than natural revelation, which, uh, according to the Bible, no man gets saved. Romans chapter 11 no or 10, no man gets saved by natural revelation how will they hear unless we send a preacher to preach the gospel okay I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a jerk or sounding condescending I am just so tired of Christian leaders unable to give a biblical defense for the faith is that too much to ask is it too much to ask guys to go to the Bible when somebody asks them, why should I be a Christian? Why should I believe in your God? No, it's not. Or at least it shouldn't be. Let's follow the scriptural model. In the galaxies, but even down to the minutia of detail, to put that on to um, a model of randomness to me seems somewhat uh, of a leap because it's just so complex for it to be random. I, I think that there's universal yearning. I think that there's a world around us, because I, I hold to natural revelation. Um, I believe that you can use the world around you to point to God. And I think that the world around us seems to point to, to a design. For the, for, Ergen, for the believer, of course it does. But remember, the unbeliever is blind. He's dead. He's lame. He's limp. He's deaf. How you get, how are you going to show a sunset or the, the Milky Way galaxy or the Big Dipper to, to somebody who's blind? It ain't gonna work. I'm telling you folks, this is bad. Uh, even if you may not believe that that designed God and His Son Jesus Christ, then I think it does point to something. And even if a person's not monotheistic, something, yeah, something... It points to something. They'll tell you it points to the Big Bang. Because they're arguing from their presuppositions. They, there, there is no God. There's no creator. There's no personal God. It points to something. Well, we can agree on that much, Ergen. It points to something. It points to one thing for the believer. It points to something else for the unbeliever. Thing or some things that seem to be guiding it. Uh, a third thing that I would... Uh, final point that I would make, rather, is that I, I always use the idea that man's longing doesn't necessarily mean necessarily that there's an answer, but I think longing does bespeak that man has a search for an answer, and I think a search for an answer sometimes is a search for God, and I don't I don't see that search as illegitimate. When a person asks the questions, like when they have doubts and such, a lot of people I deal with have uh, 
pretty messed up okay. lives. I tell them, I, think I don't think that's a bad thing. I think okay. that that, I think that points to there may be something. Uh, there may again. be an. Okay, now are you starting to understand, dear listener, dear Christian listener? Are you starting to understand my frustration with Arminian evidential classical apologetics? Okay, I never intended to wage a war against this model of apologetics, but let's get real here. Here's an opportunity to confront an unbeliever with his own sinfulness, with his fallen sinful nature, and present Christ as Lord who will judge him on the day of resurrection. And we just forget about all that. If somebody asks, if, if this guy, Brian Sapin, asks me, give me three reasons why I should believe in your God. Number one reason, he's worthy. He made you. And therefore, he's worthy. Number two reason, if you don't bow the knee, you're going to hell. Because you are a sinner. Number three reason, now you're going to be held even to a higher level of accountability because you've been told the gospel. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners like you. And if you fail to bow the knee, you fail to worship the one who made you and even gave you the reason to reason rationally, then not only are you spiritually bankrupt, but you're also intellectually bankrupt. You have no basis for morality. You have no basis for reason. You presuppose reason. You presuppose God and God's world, and then you use those things that God has given you to deny Him. And God has appointed a day in which He will judge all men. It's that simple. That's it. Now, if you want to ask particular questions about the implications of those three reasons, that's fine. We can pull out the Bible and we can have a Bible study. But don't point to the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and the blue sky and the blue water and the white moon. It just ain't going to do anything for anybody except for the believer. The believer has his eyes open to the reality of God. He can look at these things and he can admire God. He can worship God. But don't expect the unbeliever to see these things if the Bible says that he's blind. It's just not going to happen. Okay, now at this point, Brian Fleming, the uh, the guy, the director, or the editor, or the producer, whatever it is, that put together the little home video... Uh, called the God who wasn't there that purports that Jesus never existed. This guy is about as arrogant as they come. He, he's another one that likes to pray on the weak. So he jumps into the conversation and he begins to question Ergen Kainer and he says that he's not uh, satisfied with Ergen's performance. So listen, listen, let, let's listen to what has, so let's listen to what they say here. Uh, okay. I can tell you why I believe that your answers are unsatisfactory if you'd like to know. Sure. Okay. Um, you have retreated to the Bible at almost every turn. Every time you get into a tough spot, you say that you know you believe it's in the Bible. You refer to the Bible constantly, not as an old book, but as the authority uh, for a lot of these questions. Uh, and one of the problems there is that you admit that you can't solve all the problems that cast this inerrancy in serious doubt. You even mentioned some of them, which you know I admire you for doing. I acknowledge you did mention these very serious problems that would make any reasonable person believe, no, this couldn't possibly be an inerrant book. But if you recognize these serious problems that point to the fallibility of the Bible, and you admit you can't solve them, your belief in its inerrancy is necessarily illogical. First of all, I don't think that uh, my observations were the complete opposite. I didn't see him retreating to the Bible. I saw him retreating to things like uh, man's universal uh, longing for God, uh, natural revelation, and uh, God in general revelation. And so I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Fleming was listening to the same uh, dialogue that I was, uh, but I heard something con completely different. Now, apparently, Mr. Fleming thinks that in order for someone to believe in the Bible and its inerrancy means that you have to 
not only have read the whole Bible and uh, studied it from cover to cover, but mastered it in such a way that you have an answer to every single question without further study. Essentially, that's what he's asking for. Because in the, in the few times that Ergen Kainer was challenged, he, he said that he would, uh, he would get back to them. He would go back and he would study this particular issue or that particular issue. So this guy, once again, notice uh, Brian Fleming's uh, presupposition is logic. Let me continue playing this. Okay, can I answer? Yeah. Okay. Infallibility, I don't think, is a problem of Scripture. Interpretation and the areas of interpretation that we discussed came because they are there. Whether whether we are willing to resolve them or whether we're willing to just fight over them all the time, which is what Christians do, that's not something you blame the Bible for. I don't think that I don't think that my belief in the Bible is the Word of God um, necessitates interpretation being lockstep. I think interpretation enters the human realm, and I don't confuse the nature of the Bible and the nature of interpretation as as the same thing. But back to your question, let okay. me ask you a question: Do you hold to a closed okay. system, and do you believe that the world is a closed system? I don't understand the question. Uh, these questions aren't good for me because, by the way, if we get down to it, when if you're going to ask me, do I know where the universe came from? My answer is I don't know. No, 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 uh, no I wouldn't. So. Okay, now notice here. <laughs> notice here, we've got a little uh, bait and switch. All right. Brian Fleming says, if you're going to ask me where the universe came from, then I don't know. Now, unfortunately, Ergen Kainer doesn't nail him on that. Because listen to the criticism that is coming from Brian Fleming. Brian Fleming is saying, uh, Mr. Kainer, you can't believe that the word is inerrant because when there was something that you didn't understand, you said, I don't know. And therefore, if you say, I don't know, then that means your whole system is illogical because you're believing in something that you say is foolproof, is without error, is, is inerrant. And yet, when I ask you a specific, a specific question about something that it says, you say, I don't know. Why is it okay for the atheist to say, I don't know? Why is it acceptable for him to say, I don't know, but it's not acceptable for the Christian? It's a double standard. It's nothing more than a double standard. And we need to call these guys on it when they do it. I can get on the, the rational response squad and say, well, I don't, if you're going to ask me that, I don't know. If you're going to ask me, this tough question or that tough question, I don't know. Is that acceptable? Of course it's not. So how can you criticize somebody else's worldview if you don't even know where the world came from? Do you see the difference here? Do you see the, the arrogance and the double standard and the ignorance? All right, let's, let's get maybe one more if we can. Who subscribe to that kind of Christianity, to that specific statement, are illogical. It's very fair for me to say that. If there's a God, if, I'm, I'm not asking you to say that there is, I'm asking you a rhetorical question. Sure. That I know that, that back to our original, that I know the answer, that I feel I know the answer to. If there's a God, wouldn't he by definition be able to communicate his will to man? Yes. Okay. So, that, I appreciate that. And I, I do appreciate that. So, because that's, that's the, that's something I, I normally don't hear from someone, and, I, and I'm thankful. Uh, the simple logic of it is, if you hold to a God, if, if you come to a belief in a God, and I do, and I do by logic, by my attempt to, my feeble mind in logic, um, design... Okay, now this is problematic. <laughs> he just said that he came to his belief in God through logic. Now, that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say that you come to your belief in God through logic. If that was the case, then the greatest thinkers of all time would be Christians. They're not. The Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. All right. So, while Mr. Kainer might think that he came to faith in Christianity and Jesus Christ by logic, the Bible teaches something entirely different. 
the Bible says that he was born again. And he was born again, and then his response was faith. This is why it is so critical to have a proper soteriology. How can you look at an unbeliever and say, I came to the realization that Jesus Christ is God by logic? I came to the realization of the Christian God by logic. In other words, I'm logical and you're not. While that might be true, that is certainly not the way that people come to faith. The way people come to faith, Mr. Kaner, is by God's grace. Men are born, it would be so much cleaner and more biblical and therefore God-honoring if you would just ditch your Arminianism and become a Calvinist and acknowledge the Word of God for what it says. You don't come to Christianity by the use of logic. Okay, You come to Christianity because you've been born again and you express faith as God changes your presuppositions and Christ is revealed as the only way. Jesus Christ is the only way. When we become aware of our sinfulness, when we become aware of the reality that we don't know where we came from. We don't have a sufficient answer apart from Christ. And when that is coupled with the reality that we are sinful, that we are guilty before God, then and only then can we understand the good news. That Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and all those that trust in him will be saved. Well, we're out of time for this Thursday edition. We'll see you tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Until then, may the Lord bless the study of his word.